Good evening. I'm John Unger and I'd like to welcome you to the 71st Annual Morrison Lecture. This special lecture series was endowed in the 1930s by Chinese residents of Australia to commemorate George Morrison, an Australian who was the foremost China-based correspondent of the late 19th and early 20th century. Most of the past Morrison lectures have been presented by distinguished scholars who specialize in China. But the lectures have also showcased several non-academics, including the Dalai Lama, and as the most recent lecturer, Kevin Rudd, while Prime Minister. We are fortunate to have with us this evening Dr. Berger Bakken. Among his many writings, Dr. Bakken is the author of a thick book titled The Exemplary Society, published by Oxford University Press. It is, I believe, one of the half dozen most significant English language books on modern China both in the breadth of its scope and its insights into China. The Exemplary Society shows convincingly how a number of significant modes of thought, belief systems, and attitude sets that are held by Chinese today go way back in history into ancient times. How, in a disguised form, these historical mental predispositions underpinned some of the Chinese practices of Maoist times and how they still underpin significant beliefs and practices today. Dr. Bakken's work led him, after completing the Exemplary Society, to examine Chinese presumptions and practices regarding policing and punishment. And during the past decade, he's become one of the leading specialists in Chinese criminology. He is today a senior academic of the sociology department of the, of the University of Hong Kong and the director of the criminology program there. Tonight, as you know, the theme of his Marxist lecture relates to this. It's on the norms of death, capital punishment in China. In several weeks' time, his lecture, like almost all recent Marxist lectures, will be mounted online in the ANU China Institute webpage. So if you wish to revisit any of his thoughts tonight, you'll be able to do so. After, um, after Dr. Bakken's uh, lecture tonight, there'll be time for him to respond to questions from the audience. And after that, a reception will be held directly outside this lecture theater with wine and other refreshments. And all of you are cordially invited to participate. I'm pleased to present Dr. Berger Bakken on the norms of death. Thank you very much, John, and, uh, and welcome to the talk. Now, I've heard that uh, the Morrison Lecture is a bit formal in the way in which you present it. So I had these discussions with John uh, before these things that I normally cannot really read from a paper, but that's uh, this kind of requirement for the Morrison Lecture. You keep much to your notes. I'm sorry about that because I'm much more lively when I walk around and this is the size of my undergrad classes in Hong Kong so I normally go around and I get these things, I tell stories and uh, I will have to keep more to the script here and now. Well, I'm not talking, the, 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 the talk is called The Norms of Death and Capital Punishment. I'm not talking too much about the sentencing practices. Of course, that, uh, there have been some very, very significant uh, reforms in China quite recently. The, the, the Supreme People's Court uh, is now reviewing the death penalty cases that come from lower uh, parts of the, the judiciary. And uh, they also have taken down the number of uh, uh, death penalty uh, crimes, uh, uh, crimes that give the death penalty from 68 to 55 quite recently. Uh, I'm not talking too much about the, the sentencing practices, I'm talking about the opinions among Chinese people and the vast changes that have come actually over the last 10-15 years in China. It's quite stunning what has happened on the grassroots levels in, in China. So let me just start with the, with the, with the basics here. Um, over the last two or three decades, the world has seen a virtual revolution in the way in which the death penalty is perceived and uh, practiced. In 1977, 16 countries uh, had uh, abolished the death penalty for all, for all crimes. 
1988, 35 countries had done the same thing, and today two-thirds of the world have actually gotten rid of the death penalty. About 140 nations have gotten rid of it. And the 58 countries that still are retentionist states, only 18 of them actually utilized the death penalty last year. In uh, terms of opinion, there's also been a lot of changes. Um, the death penalty numbers in, in China are state secrets. We do not know the exact numbers. We do have um, official and non-official estimates, and I have also a lot of estimates from the Gongan, from the Public Security Ministry. Uh, from 1997 to 2001, 60,000 people were executed. That's 15,000 average a year. I've seen estimates for last year, they estimated now to be about 5,000 people per year. So the reductionist uh, paradigm, reducing the scope of the death penalty has been uh, uh, propagated in China over the last year. It has had an impact on the sentencing practices. There are far fewer people being executed today than it was 10 years ago. In terms of public opinion, there has been a worldwide revolution as well over the last 10 to 20 years. When President Mitterrand was uh, uh, elected in France, he stood, on, uh, stood for election on a manifesto that included abolishment of the death penalty. Then 63% of the population supported its use. Today the figure is only 45%, with only 14% who strongly favoured the death penalty in France, and 31% who said somewhat in favour, and leaning towards abolition. The European Union decided to declare a death penalty zone in 1998, and the practice is now banned within its borders. Only the United Kingdom, actually, with a 50% support rate in Western Europe, is the only one that doesn't have a majority against the death penalty. And that has happened in a very few years only. In Australia, the, the, the developments have, have gone even faster. In 1995, 53% of all Australians supported the death penalty, and last year, 23% supported the death penalty. That's an enormous uh, change in a very few years. In contrast, a large death penalty survey done by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in 1995 showed that 99.2% of the Chinese population supported the death penalty. Now that's the starting point that uh, we will talk much more to, because this has changed quite dramatically. When we focus on the majority trend in the world today, the recent rapid change in opinions runs counter to former taken-for-granted assumptions of punitive norms in general. Until recently, it was argued that people's attitudes towards punishment represent a core element of culture. Remember that, a core element of culture. That people's punitive attitudes are an important cultural point of reference. A much-used textbook explanation uh, was, quote, we learn to react punitively just as we learn to speak a language. In other words, this statement asserts that punitive norms are strong markers of culture and stick to us in much the same way as a language does. But it will be seen tonight that punitive norms in fact fluctuate much more readily and are much less culturally rooted than the learning of a language, be it native or a learned language. Notably, the Chinese government and many Chinese intellectuals share in the assumption that there are deep cultural roots in Chinese death penalty sentiments. China's Premier Wen Jiabao has claimed that China would not abolish the death penalty due to, quote, consideration of China's national conditions. In a recent anthology of the uses of the death penalty in China, Professor Gao Mingquan argues similarly that execution is based in what he sees as a Chinese retributive culture. Gao goes on to argue that the consequences of such deeply rooted punitive preferences is that China will not abolish the death penalty at present or in the near future. They've been talking about 50 years. In 50 years' time, they might actually abolish the death penalty. Again and again, in Chinese journals and books, we hear the argument that China has a 5,000-year-old tradition of death penalty, and, this, and that this accounts for why China today adheres to the practice. One may ask, is there any country that doesn't look back at a heritage of thousands of years of death penalty traditions? So much for that argument. I'm coming back to that. Of course there is a tradition of retributive penal populism in China as there is elsewhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, 
when people believe in the alleged effectiveness of harsh punishments. And yes, there are popular traditions of revenge in China. Of course, there are always cultural links to violence, as in the occasional uprisings in history by poor peasants seeking vengeance for harm visited upon them. Elizabeth Perry has noted that certain policies of the state under Mao Zedong contributed to the survival and strengthening of traditional patterns of violent activity. The early Communist Party had seen the death penalty as a cruel practice, but on the 15th of June 1922, the Communist Party formally suggested that the death penalty should be abandoned. Mao Zedong, however, he saw the notion of people's revenge as a political tool. He declared that the death penalty, although it should be used with caution, as they say, caution, they still say that at the, the time when they, uh, they executed 30,000 people per year in 1983 during the Yanda campaigns, it was used with caution. Of course, it is still many times more than the rest of the world combined. Even the 5,000 number is many times more than the rest of the world combined in terms of execution still. He said it, Mao said it must be effectively utilized against the worst local tyrants and the evil gentry in order to strengthen the class consciousness of the masses. Mao advocated that the people should have the right to take revenge against their exploiters. He refuted the argument that peasants had gone too far and supported the killing of landlords, claiming that it is necessary to create terror for a while in every rural, rural area to be able to fight the rule of the landlords. This is 1930s, 20s even. Mao saw execution as justified on the grounds of retribution to assuage the people's anger, as he says. Minfen, minfen, the people's anger, the people's revenge, as I often uh, translate it, but vengeance is the basic principle that actually was uh, leading the revolution in those days. The Maoist argument today about appeasing the people's anger seems to have developed into a basic legal principle that still lingers on, legitimizing state violence and capital punishment. In a survey, a very good survey, that the representative survey, I'm coming back to these surveys later on, of uh, legal personnel in China that was conducted in 2007, 90% of the respondents answered that the principle of minfen, or vengeance, continued to play a role in the use of the death penalty. Only 2% thought that the aspect of people's anger had no impact at all. And here we're talking about the legal elites in China. The paradox here is that a society that claims to work for the aim of creating a harmonious society, is based on such basic principles of revenge. Chinese scholars uh, have actually talked about what they call the square effect in the open square, the, 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 the justice in the open square, a square effect of escalating revenge linked to Minfen. And others have warned against the excesses of a revenge psychology, leading to an escalating spiral of violence. And these warnings are well founded. If you look at the scholarly literature on revenge, it has been found that uh, revenge seems always to tend towards excess and escalating cycles of violence. So why use that for a harmonious society? Where we are likely to lose control, I'm quoting from, uh, from, from the scholars in the field, rather than stay in control, that the appetite for blood is hard to stop when such principles are set in motion. Of course they are thinking back to the, the, the Cultural Revolution, to, well, even further back in Chinese history. And uh, this fear of land, of chaos, is still very, very high in China, particularly among the elites. Is there a strong popular tradition of people's revenge in China by way of executions? Professor Qu Xie Wu at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing doubts the cultural argument of a 5,000-year-old tradition. He says that there is a Chinese multi multiculture of alternatives to death penalty practices. He notes that Chinese popular culture did not exclusively go by the principles of paying back a life for a life, a sha ren cheng ming, or the blood debt, the xie jai. Instead, he's talking about the principle of a life debt, uh, ming jai, through the practice of monetary life compensation, so-called so the pei ming, pei ming jiang where the murderer had to compensate the family for the killing of the family member. The issue was solved without killing the perpetrator. We know such practices from many pre-industrial societies, not only in China. J.A. Barnes claims that the, quote, 
the ethnographic evidence shows that, in general, primitive societies are not characterized by repressive laws, and that it is, quote, governmental action that is typically repressive. The cultural explanation of people's revenge is secondary, in my opinion. The governmental practices of the dynastic bureaucratic machine were primary. The death penalty was always primarily political, not cultural. Today, a culture of popular violence has become the pretext for the state to explain and justify the uses of the death penalty. What about imperial Chinese history? When you look at the practices of the imperial state, there are no reasons to believe that it was punitive compared to practices in other parts of the world. We're talking about feudal worlds here. Historically, China has experienced the brutal legal elite philosophy of the ancient legalist school. But this was tempered by the approach of the Confucian school, and the legalists forcefully advocated harsh punishments without mercy, whereas Confucian scholars emphasized virtue, benevolence, and mercy. There are two different uh, elite theories on this thing. No doubt the legalist paradigm has left a lasting legacy of a brutalizing state. But on the whole, we cannot find that Chinese history has been more brutal than, let us say, European history. And let me warn against the concept of the West. I always do that with my students in Hong Kong. We talk about the West, and I'm doing criminology. Now, what is the West? Is it Norway, where I come from, or is it America? It's very, very different. In terms of punitive practices and opinions, Europe and America are strikingly different. James Whitman has argued that these differences between Europe and America are due to fundamentally different traditions in legal institutions and thinking in these two areas of the world. In short, the, state need, the state's need for control helps to explain the use of capital punishment, but the state can also show mercy. And that tradition was as strong or stronger in China than it was in Europe, where the concept of mercy also played a role. The presence of systems of mercy, argues James Whitman, a, a, a crime historian, fantastic book on harsh punishments that came out a couple of years ago, made Europe less punitive than America. Mercy instead of revenge comes de haut en bas from up and down. In some fundamental way, it seems that one has to have the social distinction of high and low to be able to grant mercy to subordinates. Mercy is first and foremost a matter of power. And paradoxically, only power seems to be able to grant mercy. Only a strong state could deliver that mercy. Through the French Revolution, the more lenient punishments used for upper classes was granted to the common man. One of the lasting effects of the revolution was, in other words, a more lenient punishment regime. In American egalitarianism, it came in another form there and a form that I will call violent egalitarianism, because egalitarianism is very often correlated with lenient punishment, but there is also a violent egalitarianism, and I find this both in America and in China in many ways. Here it seems what was granted to the common man was that a lord should be treated the same way as a horse thief. They were both hanged. They were both hung without mercy, and Europe became and stayed far less punitive than America. Of course, we could go back to Mao Zedong again, and Mao Zedong had this uh, saying that uh, to give uh, mercy to the enemy is to show cruelty to the masses. He was dealing with this thing about mercy in Chinese tradition. In the lack of legal mercy, is the lack of legal mercy the reason why China developed such a strong cultural revenge and harshness? China did have a strong state, and it also did have status hierarchies, the way Whitman described in the case of Germany and France, which actually led to more lenient punishments. Did China not develop the institutions of mercy necessary for developing the historical trend of mildness and punishment? The answer is that China historically possessed all the ingredients expected to promote leniency in a milder system of justice. The same status hierarchies were found there as in Europe, Lenient punishment for the elite was developed through the Bai system, and a system of legal mercy based on an established status hierarchy was more developed in China than in any other part of the world. Feudal rule was, of course, always harsh, like feudal rules are. But China displayed more mercy than Europe. General amnesties and acts of grace of mercy were granted more frequently in China than anywhere else. Brian McKnight, 
has translated the Chinese expression "shu" as acts of grace or amnesty. And the most extensive form of mercy during the dynasties were called da the great acts, of, uh, great acts of grace. These general amnesties applied to the whole empire and were conducted with much ritual and pomp and circumstance. While ordinary amnesties merely reduced penalties, the great acts of mercy forgave the offenders entirely. Here it will be enough for me to point out <coughs> the existence of an extremely strong Chinese culture of mercy to establish the argument of a legal history favoring milder punishment rather than harsher sanctions. From the founding of the Jin dynasty in 280 AD to the fall of the Tang dynasty in 907, nearly 630 years, a great act of mercy was issued on the average of once every 18 months. The remarkable system of legal mercy reached its peak during the Song dynasty and executions were reduced extensively by the use of this system. Even during the last and brutal Qing dynasty, executions were often suspended, and the system of legal mercy did not disappear before the empire disappeared in 1911. I'm not saying that the Qing dynasty was not a brutal one, because it was. This is not to say that the imperial order was not an extremely harsh order, but all the ingredients for a more lenient system existed in China even more than they did in Europe. So it's no historical exceptionalism about China and Chinese history, not even the imperial history here. China is one of the few civilizations where the death penalty was abolished in feudal times. From 747 to 759 AD, during the Tang Dynasty, they abolished the practice because of the emperor's strong regard for human life. So it was an abolitionist state for 17 years during the Tang Dynasty, where in my country the Vikings were raiding and pillaging and murdering all the British. <laughs> during other dynasties, and Norway is fairly lenient these days, I can tell you so much. What does that come from? <laughs> During other dynasties, there were decades when no execution was carried out. Like during the Yuan dynasty, they have a period of 70 to 80 years where no executions were carried out. That's quite fantastic for a feudal state. Klaus Mühlmann, in his uh, good book on, 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 on uh, penal practices in China that came out in Harvard University Press a couple of years ago, he sums up the essence of penal history in imperial China. He says that executions in late imperial China were no match for the ferocious events staged in 18th century Europe. He concludes, the punishments carried out in imperial China were largely reversible and relatively bloodless, marked by the intention to carefully refine and graduate the use of state violence. The assumption of an age-old, unchangeable revenge culture does not fit the picture of the rapid change that is occurring in China and in the rest of the world today. We have the same development in China as we've had in Europe in many senses. And that hasn't been known until quite recently because we start to get good survey data. Let us go back to where we started, to the massive change in capital punishment practices and opinions throughout the world over the last few decades. The change in global death penalty attitudes and policies is one of the most rapid and unlikely norm reversals of our time. The picture is complex, but the most prominent change has been what is termed the innocence frame. The fact that people were innocently convicted and executed, the discovery of forensics, the use of DNA evidence, all of this diverted attention away from the theoretical and philosophical issues of morality to focus instead on the possibility of errors in the criminal justice system. You haven't really seen this in front of your eyes, but when you think of Australians, 53% supporting the death penalty 15 years ago, and 23% of them supporting the death penalty today, something has happened. And it has happened without too much ado, and it's been becoming a mainstream norm. A tipping point has been reached in the death penalty debate, where changes in public opinion has led to further changes in policy, which in turn reinforce those same changes in public opinions. And this is something very interesting in public uh, opinion research that I'm coming back to in a while. In sociology, scholars like Mark Granovetter has explained how norms can change suddenly and in spectacular fashion. Granovetter talks about threshold models of collective behavior and explains how a critical number of opinion holders can suddenly challenge what is called the mainstream opinion. Journalist Malcolm Gladwell 
explain the potential rapidity of normative change through his term tipping point. He also talks about threshold or boiling point where the rapid normative change occurs. Not the core values of unchangeable norms, but a rapid normative change. Such processes have proven to be self-reinforcing. Policies and practices that have been stable for decades, reinforced by an established way of thinking of a problem, can change suddenly and dramatically when new dimensions arise. The mainstream anti-smoking norm, if I had been here in the 1970s when I was studying, everyone would have been puffing away, I think. And this norm burst into what pe public, opinion recall, uh, public opinion research calls a social cascade of norm change. Studies on social cascades have recently focused on how information uh, disseminates through social links in online social networks. The internet in China has created a blogosphere of great importance for the spread of information and rapid opinion change. And a lot of what I know about opinion change in China comes from the blogosphere, comes from stories placed on the blogs where they discuss things. It's quite a fantastic uh, uh, experience to read these blogs. It's even easy. It's easy Chinese. The point to be emphasized here is that sociology contradicts the Chinese allegation of slow cultural change in a range of areas. Penal norms in general and death penalty norms in particular are not necessarily core cultural norms. I say this again and again because this is a very important part of the, 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 my, my argument. It's not learned like a language, it's not hard to change, it's pretty easy to change. The death penalty norm has changed dramatically worldwide in only a decade or so. We have to look at how the death penalty debate is being publicly framed. And I told you about the innocence frame. An innocence movement was developing in Europe and America among academics and acti uh, activists in the late 1980s and uh, has exploded into the main frame of death penalty debates today. The former deterrence frame, where people thought that, oh, the death penalty is actually deterring crime. I can say something outside the manuscript about that, because we had this survey among uh, American sociologists and criminologists. They found out that more than 90% of them think that the death penalty doesn't have a deterrent effect on crime, a general deterrent. Of course, it deters the person who is actually executed, but not more than that. <laughs> and more than one third of American uh, criminologists now think that it has a brutalizing effect. It has a negative effect effect, it leads to more violence. This is the escalating, this is the, the escalating effect that I was talking about, because it is a kind of a revenge principle. In China, exactly the opposite. 88% of people in criminology think it has a deterrent effect. That's quite interesting. Well, the times have changed from that type of deterrence frame. When Isaac Ehrlich, in 1975, an economist professor, went to Congress with evidence that one execution could save at least eight future victims. And it escalated. They started to say that it saved 22 to 24 victims. Uh, and of course, then it would be another, another story. Such arguments, actually, this was also quite crucial in getting the death penalty reinstated in America in the 70s, when they had the moratorium for several years where they didn't use it. Now, such arguments are thoroughly dead and buried. The deterrence argument, the deterrence frame is dead and buried. Since then, the methodology used by Ehrlich has been condemned as flawed and unscientific by mainstream scholarly community. Instead, the framing of the debate is now focusing on the issue of system fallibility uh, uh, seeping even into the closely controlled Chinese blogosphere, the internet. The innocence frame has affected American sentencing practices. The number of executions had gone down substantially over the last 10 years, even in America. When attitudes are tied to core values, however, new information does not seem to produce substantial attitude change. Because in America there is such a thing as a core value about the death penalty, without being pressed for specifics, people tap into their core values. The reason for the slower change in America compared to Europe is historical, as I've explained a bit of, but is explained by the fact that most Americans' views on the death penalty are closely linked to the religious sentiments. The more literalist and fundamentalist, the more they are pro-death penalty, and the evangelist uh, movement um, of Protestantism in America is actually the lobbying against uh, r getting rid of the death penalty. The death penalty is actually taken away in 13 states now. In China, 
the claim that punishment opinions are based on cultural core values seems to lack substantial evidence, other than in the form of anecdotal examples, the support for sayings like kill the chicken to scare the monkey and scare one to warn a hundred, are still mere anecdotes of popular retribution, spare the rod to spoil the child. Well, if you smack the children over the fingers, it doesn't really give you evidence that you actually are for the death penalty. And it's no link between them, and nobody has actually been able to point out that kind of link. But this kind of Anecdotal evidence is used by all kinds of people in China, by, by Chinese scholars as well as, as, as Western scholars. This is very strange and it's never substantiated with any kind of research or any kind of important uh, 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 substance at all. Like any society that comes out of a rural and authoritative, authoritarian past, there will be support for such practices, of course. But this does not lead us to understand today's death penalty opinions. If you look at the most recent opinion data in China, we find evidence that death penalty attitudes are all but core values. In the recent representative survey done by the Max Planck Institute in cooperation with Wuhan University, and this is a fantastic survey that was just released this year, uh, 25, only 25% of the respondents were concerned by the issue of death penalty. Does that witness about the core culture? No, it doesn't. It's shockingly low. Many respondents answer, don't know, we're not sure to the different questions asked. When the public does not really pay attention to the death penalty question, this may function as a conservative element against change. At the same time, low salience opens up large possibilities for change. It certainly does not show the strong cultural roots of punitive attitudes among Chinese people, as claimed by the culturalist argument. Instead of reflecting core values, this evidence of lacking salience and relevance and, and, and interest in the death penalty points in the direction of a disinterest and a confusion and a situation that's highly susceptible to change. And I'm coming back to this one later because this is not like, oh, they say, we don't know, we have no clue because they don't dare to answer this questions. They were asked a lot of other questions related to the death penalty. I'm coming back to that. And that gives us a profile of these people that say, I don't know, because they do have all kinds of opinions about the death penalty. So we'll show later. Not until very recently has the degree of support for capital punishment in China been scientifically documented and or empirically verified properly by research. This is not to say that we have not had interesting data to work with. But only recently has the survey data, based on cooperation between Max Planck and Chinese researchers, been able to present the cutting-edge representative survey on capital punishment in China that has now come out. The two surveys, in fact. One survey was conducted, uh, the general survey was conducted in three provinces of Hubei, Guangdong and Beijing uh, during 2007-2008. It was published this year. Uh, at the same time, we have data from a big survey by the Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing in 1995. And in addition, we have a string of other surveys of greater or lesser importance and methodological stringency uh, that has been made available to us over the last decade or so. There's been criticism against the Academy of Social Sciences survey from 1995. I will come a bit back to that later on, but the latest surveys are really the good surveys. It's actually, I could use this as a background now because... Uh, this is uh, Liao Wang, uh, latest issue of Liao Wang. They are discussing the survey. They are discussing the, the, the Max Planck survey. They have completely misunderstood it. For one thing, they say, oh, peasants are the ones who are supporting the death penalty more than anyone else, because 30% of all the people who said that they supported the death penalty were peasants. 34% of the, 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 the survey was among peasants. So peasants are less punitive than the rest of the population. They can't read these things properly. They even also say that, well, it shows exactly the thing that legal elites are very much against the death penalty and the people are very much for the death penalty. How they can get that out of the survey, I will come back to later on. Another thing that is wrong about this, what's wrong about this picture? It's a hang knot. They don't hang people in China, they shoot them or they give them injections. But anyway, it's the scissors. I don't think the scissors can actually cut that rope, but that's another <laughs> thing. Something wrong about that. Uh, we know that survey data and survey results can be dramatically altered by the methodology used, the way in which questions are phrased, and even by the questioning sequence used. 
The most common question used in capital punishment surveys asks respondents if they favor the death penalty in the case of murder. As I noted before, it will be easy to support the death penalty in the abstract in response to a survey question, even if one would be equally easily influenced by the possibility of errors in particular cases, which makes it harder to say you afford the death penalty. The innocence argument is closely related to the shift between, uh, from thinking of the issue in an abstract to considering a concrete decision about a particular individual. And this is the impact of the innocence frame that has come over the last years only. Of course, innocence has been there over all these years, but it has come and become the mainstream frame of the debate. It's not the moral debate, it's not the deterrence debate anymore, it's the innocence frame. This shift may not f be fully reflected in most public opinion surveys, but becomes evident when a question brings a specific case involving execution to the attention of the respondent. Sorry, um, sneezing. Let us then look at the survey data, the Max Planck data, and start with the, the particular question. Normally, public opinion surveys have a lower percentage answering they are for capital punishment in the case of murder than for capital punishment in general. Naturally, we would think. In America, 69% supported the death penalty in general last year, but only 52% supported the death penalty for murder. If you go to Europe, you will find not 52%, but in Germany it's 11%, in Spain it's 14%, in Italy it's 15%, in the Czech Republic it's very low, in former fascist states and the socialist bloc, there are very low uh, support for death penalty and pun punitive re uh, reactions in general. Very interesting. I won't talk about that here, but we find this pattern in other societies. The strange result found in China is that 78% uttered support for the death penalty in cases of murder but that the answer to the general question, we'll come back to later on, of support for the death penalty in general gave only a 58.7% support. Think of that. It's a support that is lower than in the United States, considerably lower than in the United States, even if the death penalty for murder is higher for some strange reason. What is the difference here between 1995 with 99.2% support for the death penalty back to a 58.7% for the death penalty? Because actually it's the same question that is being asked in these two surveys. That's very interesting. It's a dramatic development. The death penalty for murder group answers don't know, not sure to the general question, but in the general survey, the abolitionist stand has also increased from 1995, 0.8% wanted to abolish it, and today 14% want to abolish it. And two surveys find the, the number of 14%, some find the number of 17%, but it's definitely sort of a, a much larger number who is clear abolitionists. A majority is now talking about reducing it. It's not always been like that. The debate on reducing the death penalty seems to have a massive change in opinion, led to a massive change in opinion, because this has been an official debate of reducing the death penalty numbers. In a public security survey from 1992, we go even three more years back in time, as many as 60% thought punishments were too lenient, and only 2% thought the draconian death penalty regime was too strict. 2%. In the 1995 survey, this number had increased marginally to just over 3%, uh, including the 0.8% that were abolitionists at that time. In the 2000, in, in, in a, in a 2008-2009 survey, a lot of groups in China had majority opinions against or restrictive of the death penalty. Among 1,131 students in the survey, nearly 85% wanted to reduce or abolish capital punishment. And in 1995, the students were fairly conservative. Students in public opinion surveys are lit wearing from one side to the next, and they follow the trends, the modern trends, much more readily than others. That's also interesting, because you found several surveys, quite recent surveys, smaller, non-representative surveys, that find that students are very, very punitive, particularly Chinese students in America. And in one of these uh, articles, they said, well, even the influence of Western culture didn't uh, take them away from the death penalty uh, uh, paradigm. In America, 
excuse me, it's actually more support for the death penalty in America. And very often overseas uh, groups are more conservative than groups in the country because they haven't followed the trend and the opinion change in that country. That's very interesting. But 85% in this survey from 2008-2009 were actually for abolishment or reduction of the death penalty. Most notably in this survey, that is not a representative survey, but they did 726 inmates, people in the Laojiao and the Laogai, in prison or reformed through labor institutions, and 91% of them wanted to abolish or reduce the use of the death penalty. One third of them wanted to abolish it entirely. Does this tell you about the core culture, or does the core culture suddenly disappear when you're in a prison? This is what is called situational norms in sociology. It, this, concrete situation that you are in is changing your attitudes to this. These people were not on death row, but they had seen the injustice of the system from the inside, and they react immediately, 91% against the present use of it. Another piece of evidence that the moralist core argument does not work well is the growing awareness of the class bias of capital punishment. Ask the question, Question, quote, if a poor or a rich person in China committed the same serious crime for which the death sentence could be imposed, is one more likely to be sentenced to death than the other in real life? Nearly 70% of the respondents answered, the poor person. The poor person will be sentenced to death. That's pretty good. The significance here is that the common man in China has begun to see the flaws of the judicial system. We know that this was a truism in the old days. The death penalty was there because there were some bad people and they needed to be exterminated. They were the enemy. We know from scattered data that the jobless and the poor are victims of capital punishment in China, like anywhere else. Jeffrey Ryman's famous line, the rich get richer and the poor get prison, also applies to China, even if we can substitute prison with the death penalty. In a survey of execution where the offender's occupation was known, it was found that 62% were either unemployed or rural residents, people who got the death penalty. Nearly 70% held a low status job. The vast number of Chinese executed for common street crimes had low status occupations or held no jobs. I think among violent crime, 87% came from jobless or low status or rural background, migrant workers, and nearly 100% of the thieves were actually uh, from that uh, social category when they got the death penalty. Because theft is also giving the death penalty in China. It's one of the 55 now, formerly 69 crimes that give the death penalty. And a lot of non-violent crimes still give the death penalty in China. The sudden doubt in the justice provided by the system the question about fallibility and unjust treatment, the accurate description of class bias on capital punishment, despite the security of numbers, represent exactly the core of the innocence frame that we've talked about. That has changed public opinion in so many countries recently. It's also changing China. Through the media, and in particular through the internet, the Chinese public has become aware of the fact that people are innocently sentenced to death because of sloppy procedures, unjust treatment, corrupt non-caring justice system. And let us look at the recent cases who's caught the public eyes. I just picked a few of them because there's so many of them. I picked three or four here. In 2005, the Ministry of Public Security ordered court authorities to reopen a rape murder case where a new suspect was caught 10 years after the 21-year-old Nie Shu Bin was executed for the crime. Nie Shu Bin was convicted of murder and rape in Shijia Zhuang in 1994 and was executed after Hebei's Higher People's Court upheld a lower court's ruling to sentence him to death in April 1995. Similarly, a butcher in Mayang country in central China's Hunan province was wrongfully convicted and executed for a crime he did not commit. A local woman, woman's dismembered body was found floating in the river. The authorities investigating the crime claimed at a trial that the murderer must have been someone experienced with a knife, someone like a butcher, because the techniques used to dissect the body was very professional and very often they do not use evidence in, course, in, 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 in murder cases. They use confessions. It's a system that is based on confession. Forensics, DNA, all these things haven't really come in yet. 
And that is also making a big difference because, of course, the procedures in the Chinese system where only 30% of people who are actually taken to court have a lawyer, have a defense lawyer. And they still see defense lawyers as people who are bad people because they defend bad people. That is a system that is actually not very accountable. After the execution, the woman he was supposed to have murdered suddenly reappeared alive. In another well-publicized case, a man was sentenced to death with a two-year reprieve in 2000, but his alleged victim, presumed dead for 11 years, turned up at his home earlier this year. These are cases from this year only. Such cases have begun to appear on the internet blogs fairly regularly. And there's a big debate on the internet about these cases, actually. Is this just? It isn't just. In another recent example, netizens took an internet, took uh, uh, an interest in the case where a Hunan citizen named Zhao was released from prison thanks to the reappearance of the neighbor he supposedly murdered more than a decade ago. Time again, time and again, these cases are coming up. There's so many of them, it's quite, quite stunning, actually. They have really left an impact on people in China, particularly through the blogs, but actually also in the press, they're writing about these things. People are asking for compensation for these things. All kinds of, 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 of cases have come up. The innocence frame has become a proper discussion in China. The Max Planck survey addresses the issue of innocence for the first time in China. The findings confirm very well the potential for change in this country. Asked the theoretical question whether innocent people might be wrongly executed. 60% agreed, while only 26% of the respondents disagreed. So they do know that this happens, but not too much. Of even greater interest in, is the answer to the concrete question if you would still support the death penalty if there were evidence of executions of innocent persons within the judicial system. And then they ask the people who were pro-death penalty. 44% of people who were pro-death penalty said, well, in that case, we would not support the death penalty. And overall, when innocence is added to the equation, only 48% of the total survey samples supported the death penalty. This is a level of support lower than the United Kingdom. The exceptionalist, punitive China is no longer there. Japan, Korea, Taiwan even, a lot of countries are much more punitive than China, it seems. This is something that has happened over a few years only. Still they execute more people than any other country in the world and all the other countries in the world combined. But the public opinion is moving much faster than the system. Now this is a level of support that uh, is quite stunning. It's back from 99.2. Maybe there is a majority still, but that majority might fall if the innocence frame is pushed harder in China. We find similar evidence in, for rapid change in, in all kinds of non-representative surveys. Survey from uh, 2002, among 2,000 people, where they showed 82% support of the death penalty. See, it's been going down over the years as well. I can set up all these surveys and I find more, less and less and less support for the death penalty if I go through the years. But not all of these surveys are representatives, so I'm not doing that. But they found 82% support of the death penalty and they also found 14% who wanted it abolished. When the question was changed and rephrased on the assumption that the death penalty had already been abolished by the state, only 60% wanted to retain the death penalty, from 82 to 60, just like that. Well, the number of abolitionists had increased to 33% if the state abolishes. And the state is using the people as a pretext for not abolishing it. The revengeful people. Now, this reflects what we already know from death penalty opinion research in other countries, that if the state passes legislation banning the use of the death penalty, remember Mitterrand, as a rule, public opinion will follow suit. For our purposes here, it is enough to conclude that there are no fixed or cultural strong incentives that force Chinese opinion to routinely support the death penalty. The only country I have found, which is the exceptionalist country that every criminologist is reading about, is the United States of America. And when the state abolished, it didn't lead to a fall in the support of uh, uh, abolishment in America because of the core values that is very specific to America and maybe Poland if you go to if you go to Europe Poland has still a core value a religiously based core value of death penalty and some strange uh, reading of the Old Testament and Sharia law of course you find that in in Muslim countries as well because it's a literalist kind of, of reading of, of, of holy texts at this stage 
more has to be said about opinion change. In many ways, public opinion surveys are fairly conservative since they tend to focus on individuals. When we study individuals, we often see constancy, but when we study aggregates, a new picture of orderly change appears. Some people are fairly constant in their opinions. These are the people with strong core values, political, often religious, and in particular fundamentalist values, as I just said. Let us put such respondents in what I call the core value group. We talk about three different groups, and I'm showing you a graph from the survey data that actually underlines my point soon. The core value group. Opinion follows a flat line of stability in groups like this. A small proportion of the public, however, moves systematically in response to the environment and new information. In the death penalty debate in America or Europe, these people were the ones who turned to the innocence frame. In the literature, such groups represent systematic change, called some, the signal uh, in, in some of the literature. That will appear clearer over time. The signal group can influence the climate of opinion in a remarkably short period of time. These are the small group of abolitionists. This is the signal group, as contrasted with the core value group. Another group can be termed the ambivalent group, where these are the people who did not dare to answer the question properly. No, they were not. The ambivalent group, the no, we don't know, not sure, all these people, fluctuates between the core value group and the signal group. This group is caught between the two other groups, but we can see the trend of change in the way in which this group leans towards one or the other part of the spectrum. The important group to target to see change in the making is the signal group, but also through the impact of the ambivalent group. In the former surveys in China done in the 90s, in the beginning of this uh, decade, it's last decade already, uh, they never looked at the people who said, we don't know, because they were seen and deemed as uninteresting. This is one of the most interesting groups, because this group is telling us about the future of development in opinion change. If the signal group is the instigator of change, the ambivalent group are the immediate followers. They tell us about the direction and the general opinion change. In the Max Planck survey, this group, who often answer don't know and not sure to the questions asked, tended to be fairly large on a lot of questions asked. Sometimes three quarters of the, uh, uh, the people asked said we don't know about. They asked them about the deterrence, the deterrence effect of, of, of death penalty, all kinds of, 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 of arguments about the death penalty. And they all readily answered to this thing, although they are unsure about whether they're for or against the death penalty in practice. Let's look at these things. 58.7% were in favour of the death penalty, 14% were opposed, and 28% were not sure. These are the three groups. Some people might argue that these people have no clue, but they do have, as we will see. It is important to look at where the ambivalent group is moving. In the Chinese death penalty debate, we see this group moving towards the signal group. The ambivalent group is working, going towards the signal group, the abolitionist minority. The undecided group may not say yes or no to the death penalty, but we still have a clear profile. This is vividly illustrated in the graph showing the tendencies towards perceived efficiency of the death penalty. The question that is asked is, do you think that the uh, death penalty is efficient for deterring crime, for preventing crime? And then they can say, uh, just a little. I don't, you can't hear me anymore? Yeah. yeah, yeah, the graph. I'm not forgetting the graph, John. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. The graph is coming up, and I will, dis uh, I will, I will leave my text to go to the graph now. I have just two lines to go, John, before I do that. <laughs> Impatience, that's good. When asked about whether the death penalty is effective, this graph is actually a pair. <laughs> It doesn't work. They never work. That's why I never use PowerPoint to, in my lectures. Never. I, I tell stories. Like I said, it doesn't work, John. <laughs> Here it works. Someone has more technical. Uh, well, I had even this laser thing. I like some kind of technology, but not that. You know the guy who, who invented PowerPoint? He wrote a book called the PowerPoint is Evil. <laughs> Norwegian descent. He's a professor at Yale University. I think the same thing, actually. But for graphs, very good. These are the core value group. These are the pro-death penalty people, and they say, 
Well, this doesn't work properly either. But they say the death penalty, see, I'm back to the basics. The death penalty has a very big deterrence effect. And this is a bit less, a bit less. And this, they say it doesn't really have a deterrent effect, but they have other reasons for supporting the death penalty, like just desserts. They deserve to die because they took a life or something like that. That's the moral discussion. It doesn't really deter crime. And that's, that's in line with, with what criminology tells you. It doesn't have a deterrent effect. But of course, if you're for the death penalty, you tend to think that it's a very, very uh, big deterrent effect. So this is leaning towards the right in, in many, many ways. See? That goes that way. Now the people who are abolitionists, of course that goes the other way. Some people say, yes, it has a deterrent effect, but the respect of life, we cannot take life. So even if it has a deterrent effect on crime, we do not want to support the death penalty. And most of them will say, no, it doesn't really have a deterrent effect, and they're quite right, it doesn't. So that leans to the left. Then you see the ambivalent group. And this is telling you about the future of China. Because in one question after the other in this survey, you find the same tendency that the ambivalent group is also leaning towards the left, not as much as the left side itself. But the ambivalent group are being influenced like public survey research would tell you towards the signal group. This is the future of China. These are the people who would make these people into a minority. And nearly is there for the time being. Even if this strange thing about 78% when life for a life is coming in from murderers is still a bit of a mystery, actually. I cannot explain that fully. But this is the future of China, the undecided at this group. It's going in that direction, and you see that in one graph after the other, and I could have presented many more graphs, John, but I just do the one. <laughs> Let us focus again on the lateral assumption that the Chinese common man the Lao Bai Xing, the hundred names, the old hundred names, is to blame for China's use of the death penalty. That the people's anger, the Minfen, is preventing the abolition of the death penalty in China. It seemed that the so-called Chinese masses are not the conservative, deeply rooted, retributive element holding back reforms. This survey data points, rather, in quite an opposite direction. Public opinion seems to have changed faster than the legal institutions, and the slogans of the government and the Communist Party. Let us have a look at this data again. A 1995 survey conducted by the Academy of Social Sciences that I've been referring to earlier found that by using a rather confusing category of high class and low class, that high class respondents were less likely to support the death penalty than respondents from the low class category. There's a problem about this high class and low class, because if we go into the data, we can see who are actually for and against the death penalty. And this is very interesting. If we look at the different job categories, we find the absolute highest support for capital punishment among military personnel, big surprise, <laughs> and the police and the gongan, the public security system, big surprise again. But 43% responded that it was too little death penalty in 1995 when it was really very much of it. And there was a long jump from these guys down to the next group uh, in terms of punitive groups. They were retired officials. 28% of these people wanted more of the death penalty, more, very few, if any at all, actually wanted to abolish it. Zero point something percent wanted to abolish it. Zero point three, I think. Personnel in the legal sector were the most liberal among the elites in 1995 survey. Only 9% believed that there was too little of the use of the death penalty, even if they had a legal education background. Young people under 25 were the most likely group to support abolishment. Big surprise, no? And those over 61 were the most conservative of the age cohorts. This was the oldest age cohort that they used in the survey, with the fewest number of abolitionists. Women were slightly less punitive than men. In a couple of surveys, women are a bit more uh, punitive than men. They want the death penalty more. And this has to do with the fear of, 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 of violence very often in, in, in the literature. And uh, this allegedly revengeful people, the category, category called masses, Qunzhong, they actually call them Qunzhong, masses, the masses of, of, of China, saw so twice as many ticking off the questionnaire for abolition and reduction of capital punishment compared to the category central party cadres, Zhonggong Dangyuan. The, the Zhonggong Dangyuan, the, the communist party cadres, wanted 50% more of them wanted the, the uh, death penalty to be used more than the people that were masses. Hmm. If the idea is leading by example, 
to overcome the things of the past, then certainly the party cadres are not standing in the front lines to educate the masses. The same can be said about intellectuals. The survey showed that illiterates and those with primary school education were twice as likely to support abolishment or reduction than respondents with university education. This is going completely against the world trend, where people, intellectuals, like many of us are, uh, would say, oh, no to the death penalty, while the masses would be much more pro the death penalty. America also has the black people more against the death penalty than people that have higher education, and so on and so forth, white people. And, yeah. The higher the education, the higher was also the percentage of the most pro-death category of answers. The higher the education, the more pro-death penalty. Close to 30% of those with the highest education, higher university education, as it says in the survey, wanted more capital punishment, but only 20% of illiterates and respondents with primary school education were that punitive. In sum, the strongest support for the death penalty was found among military personnel, police, party cadres, those with the highest education, and the elderly. The lowest support was found among those with the least education, the category, category called the masses, and those under 25 years of age. The only elite group contradicting the trend towards elite support for the death penalty were legal elites and the richest cohort. And that muddles the thing that they said to begin with, because they say high class is less likely and so on and so forth. There were also more people from the legal elites in that survey. I can talk all about this failures of that survey. But among the legal elites, there were few abolitionists, but much more support for reducing the death penalty that began to be a, a, a leading paradigm among legal scholars in the mid-90s. And now is the, the dominating paradigm among legal scholars. High income respondents fear of capital punishment for corruption and economic crimes made them liberal, confronted with a poorly regulated financial market where the distinction between entrepreneurialism and corruption is not always clear. These are the groups that are maybe targeted by the death penalty. The poor, the very rich, and, uh, well, the legal uh, <laughs> profession. <laughs> These facts model somewhat the categories of high class and low class in the survey and leave the findings in that general category somewhat irrelevant, as I said already. Today we have two excellent representative surveys. One for the general population that I've been referring to all the time and that Liao Wang was misunderstanding when they said, well, the legal elites are, are liberal. But it's true, there's a more liberal elite group, the most liberal elite group in any survey in China. Both the special survey on legal scholars that was done in Wuhan, Wuhan University, also with the help of the Max Planck Institute in 2007, is made by the same questionnaire that we used for the general. And 96% of the people in that survey had a legal education. So we know exactly a lot of things about the, 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 the legal group, the legal elite. And when you have these respondents to the same question in these two surveys, it's never been paralleled before, in general, do you favor or oppose the use of the death penalty? Legal elites are in favor in 67.3% of the cases, and the general population is for the death penalty in 57.8% of the cases, in that general question. I oppose 113 of the legal elites are actually abolitionists, and 40% of the general population are abolitionists. And you are not sure, a bit more of the general population are not so sure, and uh, uh, a lot of legal elites are not so sure either. But moving in the direction I showed you in the other table, that doesn't come up anymore. But we've seen it. See? I told you. That's it. It's a bit slow. <laughs> but if you go back to this one, you see that this assumption that they all have, even Lu Jianping, who was here quite recently, said, he said somewhere that he says there are backwards uh, mass opinions and there are advanced mass opinions. The people are not only stupid, he said, and he's much more right than he thinks he is. Because actually in one article he says that we have to educate the masses. We have to have these meetings with uh, representatives for the masses and he wants to abolish more or less or reduce very, very considerably the death penalty. And he says we have to have the masses on our side if we should change anything. He's, he's against this minfed. But he will be surprised to see that they have nothing to learn in many ways. They already are advanced. They have surpassed the elites already. So I'm coining a new term here. The conclusion we can draw from this table 
comparing the general population and the most liberal of elites, the legal elite, is that elite backward group of common people is actually more liberal on the death penalty question than any of the elite groups. The argument here is that of, it's not that of deeply rooted revenge psychology of the masses or a general penal populism in China. And this is where I coin my new thing about penal elitism. There is a penal elitism in China. The elites are more conservative on this question than the masses that they use as a pretext for upholding it. And this is a great paradox. The death penalty is a political instrument held aloft, not by a 5,000 year old culture, but by the state and its elites. This is a political, not a cultural issue, and it involves a conservative, too slow moving state and party bureaucracy. In terms of the secrecy of the numbers executed uh, in China, they do not want this a state secret, as I said, to give the execution numbers. The general public is also more advanced than the party and the state elite. Ask whether the Chinese government should publish the annual number of executions. 64% answered yes, and less than 16% were against publishing the execution figures. And you can think about who they were. In conclusion, we can say that public opinion in China is moving faster than the system itself. The only thing that seems deeply rooted in the Chinese death penalty debate is the deeply rooted myth of a general retributive and revengeful opinion standing in the way of legal reduction and abolishing abolishment of the death penalty. The penal norm, as we have seen, is far from the old mainstream assumption that we learn to act punitively just as we learn to speak a language, a matter of hard to change core culture. On the contrary, the penal norm in China and also the death penalty norm as a part of that is not part of a never changing deeply rooted core culture. It is changing rapidly and substantially and the new innocence frame is one of the driving forces in the change that we have seen on a global scale for some years already. This frame is beginning to establish itself also in China and John Kingdon has quoted Victor Hugo in trying to understand the power of framing, how you frame a debate, the innocence frame. And he says, Hugo says, greater than the tread of mighty armies is an idea whose time has come. And the innocence frame is clearly an idea whose time has come. And death penalty opinion in China is in the process of radical change. Thank you. Thank you, that's fascinating. Perhaps we can have questions and comments. Who would like to go first, break the ice? Thank you very much, that was great. The, uh, the, the trend that you described <coughs> seems to coincide in time with unprecedented material well-being. That is, prosperity in China seems to have uh, been accompanied by uh, decreasing support for the death penalty. If there were uh, an economic shock, a reversal of this trend towards prosperity, would that affect um, public opinions regarding capital punishment? It's a very good question. I, it also has to do with modernity as such, actually. And I think, yes, it might, but I don't think it will alter the trend. You have seen that the number of, well, if there is a, a, an economic downturn in China, you will see more crime. Because you, in, in China, you have a very, very serious uh, development of crime because you have a class of nearly 300 million migrant workers that are doing 80% of all the violent crime as is recorded in China. And of course, without proper means these people will be even more uh, a criminal part of the country but uh, uh I don't think that what is actually very, very significant in, in Lu Hong's big Tianjin survey, he asked the question whether they blame the, 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 the migrant workers for the crime in China. And very strangely, because you would see during the, the Industrial Revolution in, in Europe that the dangerous classes, that they call them, people fear the dangerous classes. In America, people fear the blacks. They fear the people who are doing the crimes. In China, people know that the migrant workers are doing the crimes, but they don't fear them. They said, well, 70% 
90% of them said the poor will get the blame. They actually also said we're not in, in fear of the, of the migrant workers. They understand the migrant workers. Instead of more support for the death penalty, I think that the minfen, the, the public uh, anger, is turned against the government instead. One very telling story about how Minfen is turning against the party, this was party policy, is the fantastic case of Yang Jia, the guy who killed six policemen and wounded three policemen in, in, in Shanghai, he went to the police headquarters and cut their throats off. And he was executed immediately afterwards because he was innocent, innocent. He, had, he had been caught because he, had, uh, he was accused of having stolen a bicycle. He had rented a bicycle when he was visiting Shanghai and they beat him up, they roughed him up. And he wanted compensation for that and he wanted them to take back this, this false allegation that he was a thief. And when they didn't want to do it, he killed six people and he was immediately executed. And what happened was, there was a big demonstration outside uh, the courtroom when they, they, they gave him the death penalty, demonstrating against him. They call him the knife man. You find him in texts, rock singers are singing about him. The knife man is all in our hearts. He is, he is uh, 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 the Dasha, he's, 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 the Dasha. he's the swordsman of the people. They have these posters, the graffiti in, in all over Guangzhou now, because we looked at I took pictures of it, I don't have it here, when it says, kill the cops, live the knife man. These things are happening in China. They even have demonstrations outside the courtroom. And they are very, very uh, 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 nervous about this, that this minfen will not turn into more support for death penalty or anything like that, but will turn against the government. I think this is something that every person in the top uh, uh, level of the party will tell you they fear this very much. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Um, and if, if you dismiss the factor of core uh, value of uh, 5,000 years, uh, in pursuit of what other explanation there is for the conservatism uh, of uh, China for its region, can, can you tell us a little more, firstly, about the absolute level and the trend of support for this country in, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And secondly, could you say anything about the tendency of post-revolutionary regimes which come to power through violence and, and then sacralize that of the violence? Um, and whether there is a, a tendency in that direction for such regimes to be more punitive or take longer to renew What's her name again? Uh, Peter, help me. The the one who was writing about violence after wars. Uh, Sorokin. No, not Sorokin. Uh, there were three of them. Uh, it's a woman. Archer and Gardner. Archer and Gardner was actually something that would answer this question because they claimed that after wars and revolutions, we might add, there is a tendency towards much more violence and also probably more punitive attitudes that is lingering on for some time after wars. And the big upheavals of Chinese history since, 19, since the Box Rebellion go all the way up from there, it's been extremely violent. When in, in the 15th of May 1951, it was actually said by the Communist Party that they should have this campaign, the Sanfen and Wufen campaigns actually against counter-revolutionaries and remnants of the old regime. They said that they should uh, execute one out of ten in the cities and one out of twenty in the countryside. I can't remember exactly, but the, 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 the number of counter-revolutionists was set to 600,000. They actually said that five to ten percent of them should be executed. In the end they executed 750,000 people, more than the full quota of it. And of course the brutalizing effect of that, China is quite another country today, but the, the closeness of that brutalization is still with them, very much. And it's a historical reason for why that happened. And the Communist Party wanted to abolish the death penalty in 1922. And of course, the Min Fen came in, and all the propaganda has been so strong that when I came there as a student in 1983, I was r reading this first time I read Chinese. I was trying to read these posters that were up all the way around, and they had the little red tick at the bottom of the poster. And that was executions. And that they had the Yanda campaign, the hard strikes campaign against criminals. And then it was a truism. 
that of course these were bad people that should be executed. Only since I was a student there until now, this has completely changed. So yes, it's the long durée, as, as Brodel says, actually, the, 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 the history of violence and the aftermath of war is actually one way to explain why it has been so punitive. Much more short-term history than the long-term history into the imperial past. I think it's the short-term history of a brutal hundred years in China that has made that, and the complete lack of discussion about the death penalty and the uses of the death penalty. Of course, now the innocence frame is coming through through the, the, the blogosphere and the media even, and this is a vast change. Of course, China was much more brutal in, 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 the, in the, 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 the 1950s and the 60s than it was actually in the 80s and the 90s and, and now. So it's, it's going in the right direction. Aftermath of war and uh, revolution is definitely a big, big uh, chunk of the explanation about uh, punitiveness in China and punitive uh, uh, attitudes in China. It's still very punitive. Taiwan, I'm, I'm just about to cooperate with the Taiwanese scholar to try and find out why the support for the death penalty in Taiwan is higher than in the People's Republic of China. Now, she didn't know that, but that's very interesting to find out. Singapore, well, it depends on the daily form of the ultimate leader, I think. He's becoming soft on, 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 uh, on um, uh, certain questions now, like uh, gay people are accepted by Lee Kuan Yew, suddenly. Uh, they had 70 executions per year a few years ago. Now they have one or two. It's because the ultimate leader is getting soft on his old days, according to what people tell me in Singapore. But Singapore is actually more hard to get data from than is the People's Republic of China. And uh, this is a part of the developmental state. This is politics. This is so much politics. It has nothing to do with Chinese culture. It's a good question. But we will try to look at that because Korea and Japan are very punitive. They're much more punitive than China. And why are they? Because they're confusion? It can't be because they're confusion, because Confucianism is about the benevolence. And uh, I don't know, we were talking about that <laughs> the other day to Japanese colleagues. No, this, this is a good question. I'm, I'm looking into that. I'm a comparative criminologist, actually. I'm looking into that. Can I just ask a small question? Yes. Uh, you just said that, that Japan and South Korea are more punitive. Do you mean in public surveys? More yes, more okay. pu public service. Uh, not at all when it comes to executions, because actually they, they hardly execute anyone in, 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 in Japan. The worst thing about Japan is that when you're on death row, you have no clue when they will come and fetch you. You can sit there for 50 years, and every, every time people knock your door, you will, you, will, you will jump up. And this is torture. This is seen as torture by Amnesty International and other groups. But of course, there are very few executions in this country. And Singapore had more executions per capita than the People's Republic of China in the worst years. They had like, uh, how many would that be? It's four point something million. In, in, uh, this would be like 70 executions in Sydney in a year. Now, you can think about 70 people in Sydney that you want to get rid of, but it's actually quite a important <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks for that talk. Um, I guess my question is towards um, whether this is a specific thing about uh, justice and uh, the death penalty, or whether the elitism, the conservative elite, uh, can be found in a number of other issues. I mean, whether, you know, we, we keep saying that the middle classes in China are not going to lead China towards democracy because they're more conservative than what it would have to be if they wanted to sort of push for a democratic change. The same thing can be probably said for a number of other issues. So one is wondering whether um, what we're seeing in the death penalty, in the question of being conservative on the death penalty, comes from somehow the same roots of the elites themselves. Whether there is a, a common root for all the different conservative entities that one finds in, in China's elites, and, and whether that is uh, uh, somehow, as you somehow you were, you were suggesting that there's a, there's a political attitude towards any kind of change that can produce any kind of uh, transformation in the present setup of society, so that it leads to some kind of being uh, status. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether you could expand on whether this is something that can be found in the population. If you decide, for example, Towards uh, other uh, issues generally considered modernizing society. 
That's a very interesting question because actually that is what I'm doing. I am a sociologist that has sort of turned into a criminologist over these last years. And some some guy commented one paper I did the, in an in, in American uh, criminal justice person saying, I'm not really a criminologist. And I said, thank you. It's actually quite true because what I'm actually after is to see exactly what you say. Because uh, the, the, the punitive norm is a kind of a denominator for a lot of different types of norms that has to do with conservatism, has to do with traditionalism and modernity. And some people said that the way in which we treat our prisoners is actually the core of a civilization. And Norbert Elias, the, the famous uh, uh, German sociologist, uh, his, his book on civilization, the civilization process, the uh, Theorie des Civilisations, uh, 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 written in the 1930s, is actually using the ways in which people look at punishment as one thing that is actually telling you about modernity. Durkheim is doing that as well, actually. The famous sociologists say that uh, modernity leads to a more lenient uh, type of, of justice system. All these things has to do with the development of modernity. And I'm very interested in what you say, because if this is a denominator for other kinds of, of, of changes in society in China, we might actually say that no. It might not come from the middle classes, it might not come from the intellectuals, it might come from a pressure from down below, and I think that is going to happen. But the, the classes on the top of that hierarchy will probably be pushed in the right direction. They cannot sit there and talk about Minfen and Minfen all the time, because actually the Minfen, the Min, the Renmin, is actually turning against the, 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 the leadership. They have to change it. I think this 50 years and we will de 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 get rid of the death penalty when they have demonstrations outside courtrooms saying that you shouldn't execute this guy. That this is something that is also saying something about the future of the Chinese society. This would be very interesting to compare with a set of attitudes. And we have this, this big, big discussion in European sociology about uh, a set of values that are modern and there's a lot of bickering about what is a modern type of, of, of norm. And I think this is one of the core norms that I'm looking at. And you see the rapid change of this norm. It's nearly as rapid as smoking. In some ways it can turn back again. It, doesn't, it isn't a sort of a straight line up there and it's different in different countries. But I think there is something in that. We can see some of the future in China by looking at these kinds of norms and the way in which they're changing. So I think it's one of the very interesting things, and I definitely would like to, to work with others that are looking into that kind of modern norm in China and where it will end up. Maybe Durkheim was right, actually, in this thing that he says this more leniency has to do with modernity. Maybe Elias is right. He's also saying that very often these things are transmitted from elites. If you learn to eat with knife and fork, that came from the elites. No, this might not come from the elites, it comes from down below. The autumn balance the other way around. It doesn't come from up and down, it comes from down and up. But that's very interesting to, to pursue that kind of question, actually. I don't know the answer to it. But it's an indication. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I want to make some comment on the 78% support for death penalty on murder, but Could it you? might not be of my interest, but it's mine. Um, well, when you talk about Chinese scholars talking about how the punitive culture is from the imperial China history, I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding. There is a way in the ancient China where, um, for example, if my father is killed by a person, I can go on to kill this person, and then I go to the imperial court, or what, in ancient China, I can go to court, and I can be forgiven for killing this person because this guy killed my father. And that is a mercy because I'm forgiven. That's mercy. But it's a mercy used in a way of, as penalty because that person whom I killed is, was essentially sentenced to death by this mercy uh, granted to me. So like, I think there is still an element of revenge here, especially when I mentioned Yang Jia's case um, when he killed six placemen and people didn't want him to be ex executed, essentially because he was revenging his own shame. He was fighting hard for his own honor. So you can still see this element of revenging yourself in society to I don't disagree with that. Okay. Because that is an element of revenge. And I said there is an element of revenge in China as there is in any other society. And I'm just merely saying that the Chinese revenge culture is not exceptional. 
it cannot explain the thing that has to do with, with the death penalty. It's not very different from, like, say, the Balkans. In, in uh, um, Milo Van Gilas wrote this book on, on uh, Macedonia, where he came from, where they have this, uh, this, this is Europe, uh, where they had this principle of boiling blood, that if a person in your family, this is a vendetta, this is a revenge culture that is much more pronounced than it is in China. If someone in your family was killed, you had to kill within 24 hours while your blood was running hot. And in Russia, in, in the Tsarist period, they had these duels and things. And if you were wounded, that was okay. But in Macedonia, you had to make sure that the person was dead. You had to cut his throat. It wasn't enough to shoot him, to wound him. You had to cut his throat because if he wasn't dead, you lost your honor. And of course, revenge cultures are very much close uh, and linked to honor and honor cultures. And China does have in the countryside a bit of that, but it doesn't seem that that leads to more punitiveness among peasants because they are less punitive. Maybe they are punitive on the personal level, as I said, and Richard Matson has written very well about these things. But in the survey that was misunderstood by, by, by uh, no, it doesn't work anyway, by the Liao Wang, <laughs> they said that the peasants were the most punitive. And they are not the most punitive. Maybe in terms of revenge culture, is the wrong one. <laughs> Forget about the PowerPoint. That was my, my point about PowerPoint. It's evil. It's evil. Basically, that is the thing. But yes, there might be such a thing that they might not go to the state with these things. And the Yangja case is also about revenge. The horrible thing about the Yangja case is that the, the wife of one of the policemen was going on the blogs actually and said that my, my, my husband was, uh, was an upright policeman. He didn't do anything wrong. He's not corrupt. He was big and strong. And someone stabbed him from the back. He was booed off. The, the, the internet. And I call the blogs the blogs of hatred because there is a revenge thing about the blogs as well as it is the other side, the innocent thing actually. It goes in both ways. It isn't sort of saying that there is no revenge culture in China because there is a revenge culture, but it doesn't explain anything about the, the masses being more punitive than the elites. It's another question in a way. I'm not, I'm not defining what you say about revenge cultures. You do have it in the countries. I read Richard Matson. It's in Lippmann's book from 1990, I think. That's too little. Elizabeth Perry is writing very good about these things as well, actually, from, from Harvard University, isn't she? I don't know. Uh, anything else? Or will you stop me now, John? <laughs> <laughs> I think that you are overdue for the reception. Excellent. We're scheduled to take that time. Uh, there are drinkables and eatables right outside the door, and you're all invited to stay for a bit and uh, and I'm still approachable, and so you can still ask me questions. And, and it's very approachable. Thank you.